Our next speaker for the afternoon is Mr. Craig Paris. Craig has a wide range of mid-level provider experience from primary and cardiac care to psychiatric care in both the inpatient and outpatient settings. He is currently a psychiatric and family nurse practitioner at Ohio Health. Craig also provides mid-level provider coverage for the emergency department, as well as consultations with primary care providers on an outpatient basis. His clinical area of interest is the severe mental health population, and he's a member of multiple committees, both within Ohio Health and throughout Franklin County, to develop strategies for enhancing best practice and the management of severe and chronic mental health conditions. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Craig Paris. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I would just like to say is that if at any point anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I'll try and answer them as we go through and then hopefully at the end we have some time to answer any remaining questions. I'm not entirely sure how the slides are going to work. Okay, good. Um, so disclosures, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, so. Everything I'm providing you is without any financial bias. My hope in uh, going through this presentation is that um, when, I was, when I was making it, I was trying to think, what is, what is going to be helpful for someone to know when they're in the field? You guys are doing things that I have never done. So it was uh, kind of a new experience for me to come from the perspective of being in the field with the patient in their environment. and what would be the most helpful information or helpful approaches for you to know how to do. I'm sure um, you've run into a number of patients experiencing any level of agitation and probably have your own um, experience, own tips, own tricks for managing that. But this, so some, for some of you, this may be a review. But for others, hopefully, it provides at least some new information. Um, the important things that I'm going to touch on are um, Identifying an agitated patient, sometimes it's very obvious when the patient's agitated. They're cursing at you or they're attempting to harm you or the people around them. Sometimes there are uh, more subtle aspects of a patient being agitated and, they, and identifying those early on and intervening can be very helpful. And then what are the, the different types of interventions we can use in going through it? This is uh, the definition of agitation through the American uh, Psychiatric Association. And the reason that I felt that it was important to include that is because um, there are agitation occurs along a spectrum. There's um, the very obvious agitated and aggressive person that's going to be um, up, yelling, violent. Uh, but then there's also more subtle um, symptoms of agitation, like as simple as somebody tapping their foot, somebody wringing their hands. Um, somebody just kind of shifting their gaze around, seeming uneasy. Uh, agitation is the physical manifestation of somebody's inner feelings of tension. Why is it important to, to know how to recognize and manage it? Well, it's seen everywhere, especially in mer emergency settings. Um, it leads to not only poor outcomes within the hospital environment, but also in the environment uh, outside of the hospital. It puts both the patient and staff or people in the environment at risk for injury. Um, it oftentimes leads to refusal of care. So I'm sure you've run into a patient that maybe is agitated. Maybe they, they don't um, have any specific concerns where you would forcefully put them in the hospital or transport them to some, more, uh, some specific medical care. Um, whereas if they had been less agitated or, or more easily de-escalated, they might have been more amenable to going toward that kind of care that they might need. Um, it, it causes patients to be restrained, um, which is both traumatic for the patient's family seeing them restrained, the person doing the restraints, and then of course the patient being restrained themselves is going to have um, uh, usually a negative response to that. It oftentimes leads to the need for emergent use of medications, which um, you know, when you can avoid having to give somebody a medication, that's going to be more optimal because you're not messing with their uh, innate chemistry, but there are certain situations where it's needed. Um, when, I, when I try to, this uh, initial part is, when I try to initially approach somebody with agitation, I try to look at what are the per, per possible etiologies of the agitation, and there tend to be about three general subcategories. There's impulsive agitation, which you would see in somebody who is, um, 
like anxious, distressed, maybe their personality disordered. Um, they are just kind of overwhelmed by their ability to cope in the circumstance that they're in. That would lead to more of an impulsive agitation. They're not thinking through the things they're doing. They're just like, I gotta get out of here and I gotta get out of here now. There's psychotic um, aggression agitation. That's gonna be where the person's um, experiencing a psychotic disorder or, or having a psychotic response to something. They've lost their touch with reality, so the, the source of their aggression is based in something that isn't necessarily you, you, something that you might be seeing, feeling, or hearing. And then there's organized agitation and aggression, and that's gonna be more along the lines of um, like planned criminality, people that are gonna be working, people who have full understanding of what they're doing, but they're um, manipulating the situation in whatever um, way they can to get what they need. Agitation is always a, an acute behavioral health crisis, and when you can intervene, um, both the patient, family, and people around you are gonna um, have a positive outcome. When um, initially assessing a patient with agitation, obviously it's gonna be pretty similar to assessing any patient experiencing distress. Uh, of course, you guys are gonna get um, vital signs. You're gonna look uh, at um, oxygen level, acute things that are reversible that could cause confusion, agitation, um, hypoxia, hypoglycemia. When you're evaluating somebody kind of from a constitutional standpoint, if they're diaphoretic, that may be an indication that there's another issue that's contributing to the agitation, whether it be delirium, substance intoxication. Um, that's also, the constitutional aspect is kind of important when you're looking at the subtle cues of like psychomotor, restlessness, um, tapping their foot, wringing their hands, kind of like shifting side to side, appearing in pain or appearing uneasy or anxious. Um, obviously, cardiopulmonary issues are going to contribute to both anxiety and agitation as a kind of secondary feature of somebody experiencing whether it's like heart failure, um, you know, anything that would cause any sort of uh, dyspnea or, you know, that kind of issue. Um, commonly, neurologic issues will present with agitation. It can be very difficult in the initial to identify a neurologic issue if they don't have those outward symptoms that you would think of with um, a stroke or seizure. but the, there can be even, once somebody's in the hospital and received kind of imaging and testing results, still a dilemma between neurology and uh, mental health specialties about the source of agitation. So in that initial assessment, it's, it's all the more important to keep in the back of your mind there could be a neur neurologic process that's causing this kind of issue. Um, pupillary dilation or constriction, tongue movement, nystagmus, when you're examining somebody's Eyes can also be an indication that there may be more of a CNS process that's contributing to this. And then um, patients experiencing acute abdominal pain or hyperactive bowel sounds could, could lead you down the line of, well, maybe this is a, a response to a substance. Maybe they're um, having a negative uh, side effect to a medication. In kind of utilizing those vital signs, looking at that initial assessment, you want to run through your, your differential. What could be ca causing this person's agitation? Because that's going to determine how I intervene and, and what I do to best help them. Um, probably one of the more common causes of agitation would be um, in the environment would be a um, substance intoxication or a substance withdrawal. Um, there's obviously metabolic abnormalities can lead to delirium and confusion, which can represent or can manifest as agitation. Um, we went through, I just went through the neurolo neurologic kind of problems people can have. Uh, and then there's um, other more specific medical etiologies and then um, psychiatric etiologies, which can of course present with agitation. So you have a patient you have identified that they're agitated, depending on the, the severity of their agitation, what do you do to manage it? It's always the most appropriate thing to try and first manage somebody from a non-pharmacologic perspective, something that I'm sure you do all the time. Um, there's lots of different techniques for, for de-escalating a patient um, from a non-pharmacologic perspective. Some of those will go on over a little bit uh, later in this presentation. Um, I kind of went in order of, uh, how I would approach a situation uh, non-pharmacologically, um, although I would necessarily flip the environmental stimulation. Oftentimes you'll come to a scene, whether it be in the hospital or out of the hospital, where somebody is agitated, somebody is causing people to watch, and so people may gather around, whether it, um, they be people that know the person or maybe even people that don't. So one of the first things that I do is once you see the scene and you've kind of determined 
what's, what's safe to accomplish, I will reduce environmental stimulation by limiting the amount of people or amount of stimulus in the room. So if the TV is blaring, I turn the TV off. If there's six people in the room and maybe only one of them need to be there, I would ask the other five to leave. Um, involvement of security or involvement of police would be a, a good opportunity whenever the situation feels beyond um, one that can be safely accomplished by you alone. And then use of restraints, uh, which is, of course, not ideal. We don't want to restrain people. We don't have to, though there are specific circumstances where for the safety of the patient and for the safety of those around them, you do have to restrain them. And there are um, specific instances where efficiently and quickly restraining somebody that are going, is going to be the best outcome for everyone involved in terms of even patient safety. So what do you do when non-pharmacologic strategies fail? Well, you move on to those uh, pharmacologic options that are available to you. And I'm not entirely sure. I think that probably is different based on the, the, um, where you're practicing, where you're working, even countywide. Um, but always keep in mind that uh, when you're determining what medication to give somebody, that's going to be determined by the cause of the agitation. So the better you can assess that, that initial cause as fast as possible, the more quickly you can get the appropriate treatment to the patient um, with the goal ultimately to calm them. So um, you'll hear the phrase chemical sedation or chemical restraint. Um, that is uh, not, I would, I would say it's definitely not politically correct, but it's also not the correct rationale to have when approaching someone. Um, we want to try to um, provide people autonomy whenever possible. And so even when you're giving somebody medication, you want to do so with the idea that you're um, alleviating their um, unease. And so you're providing this medication to calm them uh, and, and in doing so, relieving their agitation. Uh, and the best way to, in, to allow them autonomy is whenever possible, if the situation provides, allowing them choice in determining what you're going to give them when appropriate. Um, oftentimes, that's only the difference between offering them a pill, if available, versus something more rapid acting like an intramuscular injection or IV. Um, but I realize that kind of in, in the environmental setting, that may not, or in, out in the community, that may not be, always be an appropriate or a reasonable um, thing to do. Um, so, so one of the more valuable things that you, you can do when and being that first touch to the patient is kind of determining how they're going to, to see the rest of their interactions with them. You guys are the first people to see these patients before they get to the hospital, before they are interacting with anybody else. And so their interactions with you are going to kind of tip one way or the other their opinion of how everything else is going to go. Um, and some of, the, some of the most simple things to do are ones that we oftentimes don't think to do just because um, you kind of get into an, a certain situation, there's a lot going on and you do what you, know, what you feel is going to be the best thing to do, but, but maybe that would cause a patient whose mental status is altered in some certain way to respond negatively. So um, this is actually the eraser method or model of verbal de-escalation was kind of um, there was a, an emergency medicine kind of group that got together and they, they went through best practices of managing agitation and that was both um, from a medicine standpoint as well as verbal de-escalation groups. So there were separate subgroups that their job was to determine what is, let's create a, an algorithm more or less of how to manage agitation with both medicine and without. And this was uh, a result of the, the verbal de-escalation group, this was their, their method that came from it. One that we use regularly in the hospital every day. Um, so the first one, it would be E to eyeball the patient. So uh, initially eyeballing them from a safe distance, do they have a weapon? Is there anything else that could make the scene unsafe? Do they have something that they could grab? Is there um, broken glass? That kind of thing. Um, so once you are looking out outward from a, a safe position, you've assessed the environment, you seem like it's safe to, to get closer to the patient, Are there then look at the patient themselves. Is there any reason to think that they might not respond to just verbal de-escalation? Um, those kinds of things might be they, they are clearly overtly confused or delirious. Um, it can be very, very difficult to try and rationalize with somebody who, who is not um, in the right state of mind. And so to try and um, slowly alleviate somebody's distress um, when they're not comprehending what you're saying, it's, it's probably not going to be a successful venture. 
Um, then, of course, looking at, at um, imminent signs of life-threatening conditions, so are they diaphoretic, are they breathing heavily, do they um, have other signs that there may be an underlying medical issue that needs intervene upon quickly. And then um, this last one kind of goes along with that. Is there any specific indication that they need to be rapidly restrained or sedated? And that might be in a situation of um, like a hyperactive delirium syndrome where they're diaphoretic, they appear like hot to the touch, they're um, overtly confused, very agitated. Um, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But those, that is a situation where the faster you can um, restrain and sedate the person, the, the safer it's they're going to be because prolonged physical exertion is going to lead to worsened um, outcome and potentially sudden cardiac death. The next one, R, would be the, to respect the patient's space. And so this is one that in like the heat of a, of a tense situation, oftentimes people will not recognize that they are, they've kind of, they, they you as the, as the provider or whether it be somebody in a hospital, recognizes the imminent dangerousness of what's going on with the person. And so you're in there, you're rushing in, and you're trying to help them with whatever medical or physical issue they're dealing with, whereas they've never met you before, they're agitated, they've got something else on their mind, and then all of a sudden this person's on top of them. That's only gonna, de or gonna escalate their agitation further. So um, when I initially approach somebody, I always try to give them at least two arms um, distance enough that they know that they have my attention, it's not some, anyone else that, that I'm interacting with, um, but that they also know that I'm not, I'm, I physically can't touch them and I'm, I don't have any intention to um, lay my hands on them unless the, the situation calls for it urgently or they have allowed me to do so because they're, they're comfortable with it. Um, doing this uh, also includes um, maintaining a safe exit distance, so in situations where you're in a room, making sure that the agitated person never gets between you and the door, um, making sure that um, your whatever route you have for safety is never locked or, or changed in any way while you're with the patient or person. Um, this one I kind of touched on earlier, using, utilizing a single provider, and in that case it would be you or, or myself. Um, if, if need be, I would keep somebody else in the room, so if the person is overly agitated and aggressive and we're worried that there, there would be a, a physical danger to the person in there, um, you know, it's always appropriate to keep someone else, but it, eliminating the number of people you're able to safely do so um, reduces environmental stimulation and, and makes the person feel more at ease because they're, they know who they're interacting with, they know that you, you have their attention, they have your attention, and that um, it's less overwhelming. Um, one issue you can kind of run into in a, uh, conflicts that are between two different people is um, that one of the people can try to kind of emotionally attach to, the, to you as the person intervening, so always keeping um, enough emotional detachment from the person that you're talking to uh, or the people that you're talking with so that you can maintain um, a neutrality at least and, and, uh, and continue along with, with the provider and pers uh, patient uh, relationship. This one uh, kind of seems, it seems a lot more common sense than, than it can tend to be when you're in talking to somebody who's agitated, they're elevated, they're speaking very quickly, they're asking you your opinion on a, on a lot of different things. Well, wh well, what do you mean? How would you feel in this kind of situation? You're in my house right now, what, why, what do you, wouldn't you be mad? And, then, and you're not, they are, they're kind of trying to turn it on you when, when you want to do your best to allow them time to provide the necessary information and history um, to you to determine what's going on, but also it allows them time to kind of more or less vent their opinion of what's going, of, uh, of how the situation occurred and how we got to where we are right now. Um, so they may have been surrounded by people who weren't, they didn't feel like they were being listened to, so you've now entered the room, you feel that the, you've reduced the environment stimulation, you've reduced the number of people here, and you just kind of give them the opportunity to say, so tell me, how did we get in this situation? What's going on that, that I'm here, or what's going on? I, it seems like you're upset, can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, and then just, just letting them talk, and you'd be surprised how often somebody will just, you give them a good five minutes to talk when it's a, safely appropriate to do so, and how they'll kind of calm themselves down by getting their story out and then uh, feeling like you've created a really um, good rapport with that person just by allowing them to speak. Um, in, in listening to them talk, when you key in on something that they feel is important to them, something that they want, something they need, maybe that's the cause 
of why they're agitated. They, they wanted to get this one thing and it wasn't provided to them. Be like, it seems just, just reiterating that to them. It seems like, you know, a lot of this started out of some confusion that maybe you wanted this and you felt like you're, you're, you weren't being heard and your needs weren't being met. And now we're in this situation and, um, kind of reiterating that to the, to the person can allow them to know that they're being listened and kind of gives them some perspective that they might not have had in the intensity of the situation. Um, utilizing uh, certain body language techniques um, is something that kind of initially requires a lot of practice, then becomes more of an innate response to a certain situation. Um, having your hands kind of just there, maybe on your sides, just, you know, you're not, you're not cross-armed, your, your hands aren't clenched, which can, of course, seem like it's, um, like you're kind of ready to be an aggressive person to the, to the person who's already agitated. Um, not standing, like, slacked or slight, standing kind of somewhat straight up, but a little in a relaxed position with your knees bent, kind of shows this person that, that you know, you're not annoyed, you're not in a hurry, you're not trying to get out of there. You, you genuinely, ha they, you, they have your attention and you want to uh, hear what they have to say. Um, it, this, you know, you, you may have the urge to kind of approach somebody and talk to them with a face-to-face -face, um, perspective, uh, which seems like, you know, I'm showing you respect, we're face to face, we are, um, I'm listening to what you're saying, but the, in, in the context of agitation, that can be more confrontational, so if you, if you more, like, kind of just give a little bit of a sideways body language, people will feel more at ease, less intently, like they're, like, they're, you're in their face. Um, utilizing a calm demeanor and facial expression can be somewhat difficult in an intense situation, um, so it's always just important to, to know what your own reaction is to the situation and try and, and comprehend how you are expressing that reaction. And avoiding excessive eye contact is one that's easier said than done. When you start thinking about the eye contact you're giving to somebody, you're going to seem kind of like you're thinking about the eye contact that you're giving somebody, which can come off a little bit weird, but um, it's more or less kind of more of the, one of the more natural things you want to do um, like one of, one of the ways you can kind of listen to um, yourself, you know, you naturally wouldn't stare at somebody like this. You would kind of like glance around, look a little bit, but give them most of your eye contact. Um, once you've kind of established communication with somebody, you, you've allowed them to kind of vent, then it's your turn to, to you know, set, set the expectation, set the scene. So, you know, if somebody is being verbally aggressive, so they're threatening those around you, just inform them, like, those kinds of things we can't tolerate. You can't be threatening certain people. Like, we're here to help you. And so the, way, the best that we can do that is you talk to us and let us know what's going on. Um, but but things, things like threatening or becoming violent are not going to be acceptable, and we, have, we either have security or police here or we can get security or police here if that's what's needed. Um, try and explain them, overly explain to them what you're doing, not to a point that you're being annoying or condescending, but allowing them to know what to expect, kind of like a pilot on an airplane, you know, all right, this is the weather, this is, we're, we're going to land at this time, you may expect this or that. Same thing, we're going to check your vital signs, we're going to ask you some questions, we want to know what's going on, we want to try and figure out how do we get in this circumstance and how best we can help you. Um, always be honest and concise. So. Explain what's going on. If you're going to give somebody a medication, explain what the medication's for. If you're going to um, check a certain thing, you know, always be, I'm sure that's something that's pretty well understood. Uh, and, and, uh, but you'd be surprised in some situations where somebody would be like, oh, this is just, this is, you know, this is a piece of candy. That's not something that somebody would do. But you're going to give, you're going to give a medication. This is the medication. This is its name. This is why I'm giving it. And, and this is why um, I really want you to take it. This kind of touched on a little bit earlier. Whenever you're able to, always provide a choice to the person that you're talking to. So if you can give one of two medications, involve them in, the cho in that choice. If you can give it as a pill, involve them in that choice. Um, always allow them whatever autonomy you're able to allow them in the, if, that the situation provides. So you've done a great job of attempting to ve de verbally de-escalate the person, but that didn't work. And there's often times where that isn't going to work. Some specific ones would be an acute medical issue, somebody's delirious, somebody's really intoxicated, uh, somebody who is um, severely um, decompensated from a mental illness, or you know, just like they have a severe dementia process. So what do you do next? I'm sure you've um, kind of come across a number of pharmacologic responses to agitation, and they are going to vary based on the situation. 
um, in kind of doing some, like I said, I, I, I have no experience uh, in being in EMS, so I was kind of looking at um, different areas of, uh, and what certain medications are used. I didn't see a lot of um, second generation antipsychotics um, listed as like potential treatment options. Are these, are the like Geodons, Iprexa, Risperdal, are those medications that you guys would commonly administer in the field? Nothing like that. Okay. Benzos, so just not even antipsychotics at all. Okay. That's kind of what I asked somebody in the ER and that was kind of the response I got as well. Um, I can see probably the, the utility of that. Number one, benzos and ketamine are going to work very quickly, um, minus the diazepam, but I, I would guess you probably use Versed in most circumstances. Um, there are also certain circumstances where you, using a, an antipsychotic might get people into trouble. So if somebody's experiencing um, a reaction to an antipsychotic or you know, they're severely intoxicated with a stimulant, they're having certain issues, antipsychotic might get you into trouble. I thought I would um, include those in this because they are um, medications that in the hospital we use pretty regularly for agitation and they do have a fairly um, fast onset. Loxapine, I, I kind of threw in there with a question mark. So there's a, a new inhaled version of loxapine that um, is actually like effective within minutes. So I presume it would be just as effective as like Versed or ketamine, at least in terms of onset of action. Um, but I, I've yet to see that anywhere. It's just kind of an interesting um, way to provide somebody medication. I'm gonna probably go through this more quickly because if, if there are any questions, I'd prefer that there's time. Um, Excited delirium syndrome is kind of a, a controversial thing. Um, it's, it's in the, the things I was looking into was kind of referred to as um, death in custody syndrome when we hear about people who are detained by police um, and then like have a sudden cardiac arrest or they die while they're in jail. Um, the, the thought process behind that is there may be some relation to this, this syndrome. It is, um, you know, it, it's the, the very severe life-threatening end of the delirium spectrum. Um, it's kind of characterized by really, really significant excessive motor activity. A person that's diaphoretic, they're gonna have a high fever and even um, appear hot to touch. Uh, they'll be tachycardic and they're, they're more likely to require really, really extreme amounts of force in order to um, calm, or not even calm, but like restrain to allow for sedation. It's important to recognize when this is occurring uh, because its mortality is relatively high for this kind of a situation. It's greater than 10% of people will, will experience sudden cardiac arrest in this kind of a, um, with this syndrome. Um, there's a, a fairly longer list of like other things that might point you in the direction of your experience. You're seeing someone experience that. One that um, came up repeatedly in the uh, literature I was looking at uh, was that they have like a, a unique um, attraction or um, obsession with uh, like reflective light or glass material. So like somebody might, like if you see that somebody has punched through glass and they're also confused, diaphoretic, um, especially agitated, that might be an indication of something like this. Um, they usually, re they um, do not respond initially to even uh, well, to some medications, ketamine is the treatment of choice, oftentimes, from what I read in this kind of a cir circumstance. They have like an excessive, um, described as inhuman strength, so more than you would expect somebody, in a, a typical person to have, they can fight off more than that. This is a situation that you really need to quickly identify, and um, it's one where rapid um, restraint and sedation is, is the safest modality of treatment because the longer somebody is, um, exerting themselves physically, the harder it is on their already strained um, like cardiac uh, status and it all, the more it like increases their, um, their temperature and the more it increases the risk of like acidosis and metabolic derangement because of, of um, significant metabolic issues. Um, utilize, most things that I read said to initially utilize something like a benzodiazepine like Versed to quickly get somebody but there is some indication that, um, that ketamine is a very effective treatment in this kind of thing, in this kind of uh, circumstance. So um, in summary, agitation is a behavioral health emergency that can have a lot of different um, presentations. It can also have a lot of different causes. Um, you guys have a very unique role as you interact with somebody in their environment under a lot of different circumstances. So it's, I understand and respect how difficult it probably is for a lot of the, the um, things you, that you run into. but. Um, using your astute assessment to uh, identify both the, 
this, the environment that the patient's in and, any, and using that to help you determine what is causing the agitation is going to help um, not only the patient but help keep you and the people around you safe, including their family. Are there any questions at all? Okay. Thanks.